if you take the mood of the early Cold War era, the duck and cover era that sort of came out of the World War II optimism and that tension between like the imminent and potential destruction of the entire world and the absolute extravaganza of consumerism that we're both going on in the early 50s. Uh, you take that vibe and then you move it conceptually a hundred years into the future where nothing socially has really changed, but we also have lasers. And you also like take that world that feels familiar, but now because we've introduced sci-fi elements, it isn't exactly. Then you destroy it and you layer on like all of these post-apocalyptic tropes that have been like so classic ever since, you know, media started considering, well, what would happen if the end of the world ended? So there's all sorts of influences in there that are classic from like the Twilight Zone episode where like the nuclear war happens and the fella like who's a misanthrope breaks his glasses and that's the end of his good times and his empty world that's only him now. Uh, like that, that's so old as far as like how we think about nuclear war now. But there's there's a consistency and a through line as to like what are the emotions around apocalypse, uh, like what is the aesthetic of apocalypse, and like there's sort of an Americanism in post apocalyptic media that Fallout really embraces. Like the the Duck and Cover era was so unique and so strange, and I think. Like, to modern eyes, it seems like a very silly and naive era, which it kind of is, but, like, maybe we've just sort of gotten used to the apocalypse to the point that where the idea of, like, this looming over us being new just doesn't, like, rate anymore. Like, it's it's interesting because Fallout sort of, like, reconnects us to that time where, like, the idea of apocalypse was just as strange and freewheeling and anything goes as anything else. This is one of the reasons that I really connected with it uh, when I did, like as a young man, um, because I felt like it helped me understand my parents um, because they were, they lived with that in a way that I did not. I was born in 1983, like we have Abel Archer, and then things kind of really start to calm down. And by the time I understood what was possible with nuclear weapons, it felt like the threat was over. Obviously, we live in a much different world now. Um, but, you know, fighting those Fallout games and seeing that reflection of that anxiety and the, the, the architecture and seeing kind of the, the world of the future perverted yeah. um, is really helped me kind of understand my parents' fears and anxieties. And that's really one of the reasons that I connected with, especially like one and two early on. Yeah. So one and two were more interactive with the anxiety of it than the absurdity of it. Um, yes. Well, Fallout 1, Fallout 2, plenty absurd. Anyway, uh, the, I, I was born in 88, so after after you, so like I have even fewer actual memories of the Cold War. Like when, when did the Berlin Wall fall? Uh, like I, I must have been like... Okay, this is just not right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, first of all, okay, I was born in 71. It fell in 1989. Uh, I was waiting for you to chime in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll I'll just sit here and shut up now. But no, 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 I am. Damn young whippersnapper. Well, I am curious about like the history of, you know, somebody born in 71, the history of your nuclear anxiety, uh, such as it was. And then when did you find Fallout? Um, so that for me... Nuclear anxiety was the kind of thing that kept me up at night, and I wasn't the only one. Uh, I actually did have one duck and cover drill in my elementary school. Uh, I actually had to get down under a desk, um, which is so ridiculous <laughs> when you think about it. I have no idea what that desk was about to do for me. Uh, but, um, yeah, it was so real, so present. Uh, all the time. Um, but uh, Fallout, I think, actually let me play with those fears, too. I mean, it reminded me of, like, um, 
actually, in some ways, I have a more optimistic view of it, which is, this is going to sound probably pretty silly, but um, Fallout, some version of the world survives. I mean, you know, as opposed to absolutely everybody being dead, it's just like Monty Python once said, mostly dead. Yes, <laughs> I I really agree with that. I mean, there's a huge tone difference between Fallout and like McCarthy's The Road. Like uh, The Road is like truly, truly one of the bleakest and most emotionally affecting pieces of apocalyptic, post-apocalyptic media I've ever read or seen. Like the film version is so beautiful also. Uh, but like it, it postulates a world that has truly died, but Fallout does not. Yeah, it's a new world. It's a brave new world. And actually, in some sense, uh, the optimism of the old world that's been destroyed kind of carries through, I think, a little bit. Um, and, I mean, just because it makes you laugh, the bobbleheads and uh, the videos uh, that, you know, you break into and uh, that are just like those, you know, uh, videos from the 50s. They're just so, you know, the instructional videos. <laughs> Right. I mean, just so much of that embedded in the games that you're actually laughing your way through the apocalypse and the wasteland. You know, <laughs> it's a very weird thing. The The soundtrack carries a lot of that. Definitely. Like the the really bright uh, <clears throat> poppies, 40s, 50s tracks that they play just uh, underline it completely. And like I shit on Fallout 3 a lot and it's not my favorite game, but like they, more than Fallout 1 and 2, really united the world and that era of music through, like, their radio selections and uh, Three Dog, the DJ. Like, uh, they, uh, I'm pretty sure in the show they brought back the track Let's Go Sunnin', and, like, that one is just, like, so perfect just the way that the the lead singer like delivers that like pretty flowers need the sun and this applies to everyone like you know everyone just needs to be happy and everything's gonna be fine and don't even worry about it and like the the contrast between like that attitude and like the world itself and like the, the, the whole character of Lucy in the show, like operates on that contrast, right. Of, of her, her okie doke optimism. And then everything that she has to goddamn do out in the wasteland. She's such a perfect, she's such a perfect protagonist for a television show. Um, really just incredible. <laughs> like I can't, I can't get, a, I, I can't stop thinking about, um, as a fan of like the entire franchise, you start watching that show and I get a couple episodes in and I'm like, Oh, the people who made this have played all of the games. Uh, I'm getting like, like, obviously there's a, there's a really huge attention to visual detail that comes from the Bethesda stuff. Right. And they obviously worked very closely with Bethesda to make a lot of that, a lot of that happen, but so much of the tone and the attitude and the lore, which we'll get into a little bit later is like, Oh, this is like, we're talking about fallout one and two stuff here. Um, and it is really, it's really typified in Lucy who is this vault dweller, Jason, um, who has to go out into the, uh, the wasteland and chase a MacGuffin, um, typical fallout. Uh, and she's got, they, they, they cast Ella Purnell, who's got these giant naive eyes. Um, and she has like a very 1950s, uh, attitude towards everything and is like really game for anything and believes in the golden rule and then goes up into the wasteland and has like, has to interact with it. <laughs> And still try to retain that sensibility as she pushes through increasingly terrible scenarios. <laughs> um, so three, I assume, was the first one you played, Jason? Yeah, you're right. Um, I went back and, uh, you know, played around with the others. But, yeah, I really fell in love with three. And the, um, you live in D.C. now. Yeah, which I didn't at the time. But um, now I, I just... I just go, wow, you know, <laughs> I, 
And it makes sense that Bethesda would, I mean, because they actually were, I don't know if they still are, based in Bethesda, which they is are, right yeah. outside They're DC, still there. right? Still there. So, um, I mean, they know the district. They know the area down cold. And it's really interesting to just put those memories together with what I drive around every day. I think I would say that that is one of the strengths of the ones that Bethesda has developed is their ability to capture real life places um, and then turn them into a post-nuclear nightmare world um, is really impressive. I think especially what they, especially three and 76. Uh, when I went to, to Boston to do the real life landscapes of Fallout for the East Coast one. So I did 76 and four and three at sort of the same time in the same two week period. And um, the, the way that they shrunk the downtown to scale in fallout four is really wild. Like the pedestrian experience of like walking from one end of downtown to another end. Like I took one day where I went from like eight in the morning to eight at night. And I did like 14 total miles of just like walking around the city. And it, it felt incredibly consistent with the sort of distances and the sort of impression of a distance that I had from fallout four. Like the it's, it's definitely more obvious when they get the big landscape going uh, when for like Fallout 76 or Fallout 3. But Fallout 4, even though it has like a thinner urban focus, is actually like equally, if not more skilled at, at doing that act of sort of translation between an actual place and uh, a video game. The beauty of 4 to me will always be going to the top of one of the skyscrapers downtown and stepping outside and being up and seeing the whole landscape before me and the uh, the sound design, like the creaking and the wind, yeah, uh, just an incredible feeling um, that they've that they've built. Um, so I want to backtrack here a little bit. Can you give me your actually? What was your first? What was your first Fallout? No. Um, Fallout 1. Uh, I uh, got a CD version of Fallout 1 when I was 12, and um, I had, like, kind of a weird, complicated, unpleasant home life at the time. So, um, like, it was the first, like, adult role-playing game I'd played, like, adult in that it assumes that you want to make heavy choices and that there's like consequence behind what you do, like a, a game that like treats you, the player as an adult. Um, and like, that was an incredible revelation for me because I felt like very small and very powerless in my own life. And so in this game, like I could not only like project onto this other character, like I could build them out and build out their personality in a way that was really, that felt personal. Like going back to Fallout 1, a lot of the quests are sort of binary in how that you're, how you're able to solve them. Um, and there aren't nearly as many quests as the later games, but like even still within that more limited format, like the feeling of personal freedom and player self-determination was really powerful to me. And that's sort of like, as much as the setting, what got me into it. At 12, did you have much sense of like the nuclear anxiety aspect or was that all just kind of background stuff? Um, well, I was raised by old people. So like I, I was adopted, but it was an open adoption. So um, the my adopted parents were like in their late 40s, early 50s, like when I was born. Um, so they uh, had all sorts of things around the house, like older appliances. Uh, they had um, like all of these globes that were still labeled with the Soviet Union. And so uh, like I grew up surrounded by like artifacts of this time that like other kids didn't have in their homes. And so Fallout in a certain way, like made me make better sense of sort of like the depth of time and like the difference in time between generations, because like my parents were sort of like one generation down the line from like most other kids in my school. I just want to say that I have a globe for my dad and it actually has Siam. Oh, wow. And Persia and Africa without a single independent nation. They're all colonies. And yeah, it, I, as far as I can figure out, it's not dated, but I think it's 37. 
Wow. Anyway, it's my, one of my treasured possessions. So, anyway, sorry to break in with that, but no, no, not at all. Uh, no, I think that that's there's something about this franchise in particular that helps connect people to uh, like a weird imagined, a weird American past that didn't happen. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, there, there was this dream in, there was this dream of the fifties that we, that in the sixties that gets leaned on in this country that didn't actually exist. And fallout supposes that it did. And it went on for a hundred years. Um, and then at the end of that dream, America, uh, started resource wars to keep that dream going. (laughs) Yeah. It went really bad for the world. That's one of my favorite cynicisms of the early titles is the idea that the consumerism was always unsustainable. It just took a whole century for it to get to its like terminal point. In what ways would society twist in that hundred years, right? Yeah. Um. Oh, I thought I also, one other thing that's really interesting about it is uh, when you're talking about resources, they don't ever come up with the transistor. You're still using, uh, you know, like vacuum tubes and nuclear power, they've really miniaturized nuclear power all over the place. Uh, it, it's it's pretty wonderful for that, too. Yeah. Yeah, so, they never miniaturized electronics at all. I I love I love that bulky look though. Like the the sound of that older technology is is really something too. Like the sound of vacuum tubes warming up is just something that you could never get in a digital age. Like there's so many like markers of physical analog technology that like I I miss like uh, growing up with like CRT televisions and hearing like the clunk and then the fade in while while the tubes were warming up uh, like having that in radio with uh, vacuum tube radios like I was such a Fallout fan that like I I uh, one of my first purchases for a home apartment uh, when I turned 18 and moved out on my own was to get a, a tube radio off eBay. Like I just, I was obsessed. I wanted one. I needed one. There's that hum. There's that hum you yeah. don't get. Right. That's at the, isn't that the beginning of three or maybe it was the trailer when the announcement it's, it's the intro to the, the bus radio that, that pans out into the broken street. Um, so what do you think of the show? Um, I had loved it. War. War never changes. That's all for this teaser, Angry Planet listeners. Uh, if you like this, if you want to hear another hour of us talking about Fallout, please go to angryplanetpod.com, kick us $9 a month, and you will get instant access to that episode right now. It's up right now. It's been an hour and 20 minutes talking with Noah Colwell Gervais all about uh, Fallout, not just the TV show, but kind of diving into. Uh, our memories of the Cold War, nuclear anxieties, why it's resurgent, um, what works and what doesn't about the franchise, and it, you know, just the first of uh, some bonus content around the Fallout franchise, which is something that a couple of listeners have asked us for. Uh, there's going to be another one probably in this summer. We're going to be talking to a wonk. I'm excited about that. And we've also got uh, other bonus episodes up there now that you can listen to, uh, kind of an explanation of who these... Uh, weapons capabilities, uh, some in-depth stuff about Haiti, uh, and we will have more bonus episodes for you next week and for the rest of the month and throughout the summer. Again, that's at angryplanetpod.com. Sign up, $9 a month. You'll get an email uh, explaining how to hook up the RSS feed to whatever your favorite podcast reader is. And uh, we look forward to hearing from you.